I'd like to welcome you all this evening to the Richard Thompson Memorial Lecture, which is a part of our 20th Annual American Symposium. That also events that we have for our symposium will be tomorrow we'll have our, uh, our uh, children's, uh, our family program from 9 to 12 at uh, <coughs> room, <laughs> room 244 and 246 in the Memorial Union. Please like to attend, and we have our uh, our powwow, which our grand entry will be at two o'clock. <coughs> I'll, uh, and also, according to NASA, for our fundraiser for the powwow, also is we have our raffle with our uh, star quilt, and uh, we're selling some T-shirts and stuff to help fundraise to pay for this year and next year's symposium. I'd also like to thank uh, our sponsors that helped us fund this uh, the, the event for this year, and. Uh, our, our, our providers are the government student body, uh, via the university committee lectures, the United American uh, United Native American Student Association, the American Indian Rights Organization, the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, Office of Minority Student Affairs, Office of the Vice President of Student Affairs, <laughs> American Indian Studies Program, the College of Design, uh, Liberal Arts and Sciences, Agriculture and Education. The Graduate College, the Departments of Anthropology, English, Architectural, Art and Design, Landscape, Architecture, Richard Thompson Memorial Fund, the Student Union Board, the ISU Chapter of Phi Delta Kappa, the Gradwall Fund for Anthropology, the Dallas County Conservation Fund, the Multicultural Task Force, the Office of Emissions, and APAC. I'd like to introduce David Gradwall, who is Emeritus Professor of Anthropology, to talk further on the Richard Thompson Memorial Lecture. Good evening. I would like to add my welcome to you. <coughs> to Iowa State University's 29th American Indian Symposium. Co-chairs for the 2000 American Indian Symposium Committee are Lynn Paxson and Irma Wilson-White. This annual event is the oldest and longest continuing symposium dealing with diversity on the ISU campus. The lecture this evening honors the memory of an ISU graduate student who dedicated and ultimately gave his life in the pursuit of maintaining human diversity and cross-cultural understanding on the local, national, and international scenes. This year's symposium is entitled Dynamic Electric Conversions and Transformations into Indianness. Tonight's presentation is the 27th in a series of annual lectures dedicated to the memory of Richard W. Thompson. Rick's parents, Larry and Marge Thompson, from Prairie Village, Kansas, are with us again this evening. The Thompson family's continuing interest and concern about Iowa State University and the American Indian Symposium are especially appreciated. Rick Thompson was born at Glens Falls, New York, on April 19, 1949. He grew up in Kansas City and came to Ames to attend ISU. During his residence in Ames, Rick served as the clerk of the Ames Friends Meeting. As a 20-year-old, Rick was respected as a leader of both the young and the old. While at ISU, Rick was a member of the Cyclone AIDS, Cardinal Key, and the University Lectures Committee. He graduated in 1971 with majors in anthropology and geology. Rick chaired the National Affairs Institute Committee that sponsored the first American Indian Symposium 29 years ago. Outcomes of the 1971 symposium included the formation of UNASA and several years later, the American Indian Studies Program at ISU. After graduation, Rick worked in Washington, D.C. with the Friends Committee on National Legislation in Indian Affairs. As a Quaker, Rick was opposed to the war in Vietnam, but he went to Vietnam as a volunteer civilian worker at the Quang Nai Hospital. In pursuit of his duties there, he met a tragic and untimely death 
in an airplane crash on November 17, 1973. Rick Thompson's life was dedicated to the attainment of equal rights for American Indians and all human beings to determine their individual and group identities, concurrent with the themes of this symposium. Rick's example epitomizes the steadfastness of purpose and continuing actions necessary to attain those goals. Introducing the 2000 Richard Thompson Memorial Lecturer is Danette Vigil. Danette is a senior at Iowa State University majoring in architecture. She is the treasurer for Arrow, the American Indian Rights Organization. Danette is a member of the Hoopa Nation in California. Danette. pleasure this evening to be announcing our keynote speaker. I am a fourth, as David said, I'm a fourth year architecture student who will be graduating next year. As students, we are always hearing horror stories of the type of work we will be doing after graduation. It has been a great help and appreciation to me just knowing that there be a need and desire for architects out there to practice in a way that is culturally, culturally and ecologically sensitive. Mr. Jones is a principal in the award-winning design firm Jones & Jones in Seattle, Washington. He's a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. He's currently completing the design for the National Museum of the American Indian on the Mall in Washington, D.C., as well as has, has had work all over the United States and international. Um, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Mr. John Paul Jones. about that, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the National, the Smithsonian's National Museum of American Indian in Washington, D.C. Um, that museum is uh, well over to the field, and it's in an honored place in Washington, D.C. It's in your front yard, and Native people in your front yard. And I think that's good, because we have a lot to share and talk about. Should I talk louder? Yes, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> Let's see if I can um, find this. That's not, this is can you turn that on? I thought, first of all, I ought to tell you a little bit about who is Jones and Jones. I'm one of the Joneses. <laughs> We've been in business in Seattle for 30 years. Um, we're not architects, but we are architects. We're not landscape architects, but we're landscape architects. What it is, it's a practice of those two professional fields together, which is pretty unique. We're not some architects that have uh, a few landscape architects working in the back room. It's an equal sharing of design. And that's pretty good for a person like me. But people say, well, where are you from? So that's the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're up here in the northeast corner of the Pacific Ocean. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to help you say who we are. It's a pretty unique place. They're finding that maybe the native, some of the native people, we've been here a long time, but some came over. They're finding some maybe didn't just come through some glaciation times. They maybe came along the coast. And this is current things that are happening. And so the coast is a pretty important place in um, the Northwest. And this will give you some kind of an idea of what it looks like. Um, but it's also full of mountains. I mean big mountains, not little mountains. Seattle's got mountains to the west and mountains to the east. It's a it's a pretty uh, wild place. You can, you can get to nature pretty quickly. And it has big pointed trees. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting because, you know, a lot of places the trees are round and soft. I mean, I was on the edge of the great ring of a hardwood forest that goes all the way around the earth. And so it's a, we're in another part, and that's, uh, that's due to that ocean. We get this warm climate, and people say, does it, I hear it rains a lot in Seattle. <laughs> and uh, it does, and it's gray. You've got various shades of gray, but it's also a pretty magical place in that gray. And it has some pretty mighty rivers. A lot of them are in these dark places, though, that go between trees and rocks, and they um, there's lots of moss. I mean, moss that's like a foot thick. You know, it's absorbing all that water. So, and there's an interesting animal life in the Northwest. This is as tall as I am. Those are ants. That's not termites that you might find in Africa. That's ants. They build this out of uh, fur needles. See these little holes and stuff in here? They're bringing air in. They raise mushrooms in there live off part of that. It's a pretty neat thing. And there's a lot of unique animals from the big whales <coughs> all the way to these little ants. And there's a long history of native people in the Northwest. And it's very strong and visual. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And it's still alive. I mean, it's not something that's in a museum or uh, on books, it's still alive. People dance. Have you ever heard one of these big masks? The dancing when they are dancing and they click that beat together, boy, it gets you right in here. You feel it. So it's a pretty strong place. And cedar is very, very important in that whole thing. But I live in an urban area. <laughs> That's Seattle. There's a the space needle. Everybody's heard of the space needle. I'm a, I work way down to the uh, south end of town in the historic district. And there's my partners. That's when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, th there's three senior partners. And, and I, I show this for, for a reason that I want to explain to you. This Grant Jones, I think he's been here and spoke. A, he was trained as an architect at the University of Washington, but he went to Harvard and got his master's in the landscape architecture. He's really a very good master of architect. That's Elsa Jones. She was on a train as an architect, but she has license in both architecture and landscape architecture. So she can practice in both fields, but she really likes urban things a lot. <laughs> now I'm an architect. But when I went to school at the University of Oregon back in the 60s, you had to take two years of landscape architecture. That was part of the curriculum. You had to do it. It was pretty interesting. You don't do that anymore. It was a valuable time for me. Now, we're, we're about 40 people who are in a historic building, and we, we like to do things like most people, you know, that are, you know, we don't turn away a lot of work, but we like to do things. Like that. Back in the 70s, because of all our interests in the natural world, um, we heard about zoos that were. I always hated zoos, and I hated to take my kids there because the animals were either throwing feces at you or doing something terrible that was just not natural. But we got interested, we said we got to do something about that. And this was one of the first things that we worked on. It was a gorilla exhibit. This is what the gorillas lived in. And I just want to show you a little bit about our zoological work. It's real quick. When we started here, the zoo keepers and the staff didn't know that gorillas made nests 
every night. So we said, why don't you, in this concrete closet up there, we said, throw in some alfalfa and watch. And, oh, well, they did it. And that's uh, Pete. Pete made a nest right away. And so did the rest of them. And they, were, they started calming down. So we designed a new gorilla exhibit for them. <laughs> we took the plants away from being confined. And we took the animals away from being confined. And we did something interesting. I thought this little poster that we worked up for the San Diego Zoo was interesting. It's an amazing thing happens when you put animals in a natural setting. They act natural. And that's a really good thing for the life in general. You know about that. that's, that's where they, they still live there. You know, I pulled a lot of these plants from my backyard, actually, and brought them out and planted them. And uh, they started acting kind of normal. They started having babies, <laughs> doing normal things with each other. And um, they had a tree they could climb. And this was, this is Kiki. He's the big dominant silverback male. And it's pretty interesting. In the wilds of Africa, you see the gorillas go up on these slopes. They live on slopes, a lot of them. And uh, they have used the long distance viewing. As soon as we let him out there, he went up this tree and he went every day up there and he sat and he looked out over the whole zoo grounds. He really loved that long distance view. It was part of his environment that he was from. So it was nice to help him because it helped him calm down and he wasn't violent anymore. There's Mina and her baby. And these are common plants found in the Northwest and we thought, you think, well, that isn't like what it is in Africa, but it is like that in Africa. And we worked with Diane Fossey, and she came from Africa before she was killed. And she said, oh, just around here, those plants are just like in Africa. Why don't you plant those? And that's what we did. We pulled out in and just brought the plants. You know, they, uh, you know what nettles are, stinging nettles? Well, they've got those all over Africa, too, in West Africa. And we planted those in there. It was great. Animals were so, long story, very successful place. And you wonder, well, where's the architecture in this? Um, the architecture was in the viewing structures. You know, how close do you let people get them? What is it like? And we did these really interesting viewing structures that had sod on the roof and glass. Nobody had ever designed a glass wall that was between you and the grill. So the architecture came in through those things. We gave people different views different views of the animals, such as this. First time anybody had ever seen a polar bear underwater. And the architects had to figure out how thick that glass should be, and, you know, reflections, and do all that stuff. It was really fun, you know, I was involved in that. Plus the holding areas. That's another place that we were involved, is that the animals in the evening are put into their bedrooms, and those bedrooms, until we came along, were dank, wet places. And what we said, well, let's apply the same rules that we apply to ourselves as animals to those animals. Let's give them air and light and sun and warmth and all And we did that, and it's, it's a very, very, very successful thing. And there's a lot of firms doing it around the country. <laughs> and the main thing is that people, kids, want to get involved. They really want to get close and get involved. This, this was a place in Honolulu where you put trash in and Trash can down there. They took the trash can away, and this uh, Hawaiian kid you can see really wants to get involved with the animals. So we took that as a very important thing. This is in Seattle. This is the elephant exhibit. It's really great. Elephant exhibit. They bring the elephants right up there. And you, you ever touch an elephant? It's pretty unique. You'll never, you'll never forget it. And you'll have a, a relationship with that animal for the rest of your life. And we did things like put people in the kind of same environment that the animals were in. You know, instead of separating them out. This is in, in a, a warm place, San Diego, and it's called Tiger River Trail. And you walk down through it, and all these plants and walls and everything was cared for, put out the graphics. And these people are watching these uh, tapers come up, breathe, squirt water around, and go back down. And they, sat, they sat there for hours and just watched them. But before, they were you know, making snide remarks and all that sort of stuff. Because we put the animals in a different view, so you really saw it differently. And these are the kind of viewing things <coughs> that you walk through. They weren't, they weren't big buildings. And then ultimately, 
Disney caught on to this and said, hey, we can make some money at this. So we helped Disney in their experience. This is in Orlando, Florida. If you've ever been down there, it's a pretty wild place. And they take you around on a ride, and the animals look like they can come right over and, you know, but this is a, there's a slight barrier where it's deep right there. And you look like you're driving through shallow water, but it's deep on that side. There's a lot of staging that goes on there, but it's a pretty neat place if you're ever down there to go visit. And we said, well, what is Disney doing with the environment around the world? What are they doing? Why shouldn't we help you on, on this sort of thing? And they showed us where they're putting their money in on ecological things all around the world. They're a big donor to saving the environment all over the world. So we thought we should help them more with them too. Also, there's a lot of architecture in zoos. You ever go to a zoo and what you get to eat is a hot dog or a hamburger or a bag of peanuts, and it's kind of like, hey, where's the food, you know? Where's the food? Well, this is at San Diego Zoo. This costs about $7 million to build. It paid for itself in two years. It totally paid for itself. Because people want to enjoy it while they're there. And these things jut out over the cliffs. People set up on those things, and they're in the sun, and they enjoy it. You can go to a cafeteria, a restaurant, or you can do a, a, a box lunch place. So it's fun to be architects in these kinds of parts and give people, besides nice views and animals and really understanding and learning something about their habitat and all that, it also provides some a new place for them. Looks like a place to go, doesn't it? <laughs> it's fun. There's another part of our practice that deals with parks. People do parks all over, you know, they're in their cities. This one's on a lake uh, called Lake Washington, which is uh, south. Um, I was talking to some of the students today when we were talking, see these floating things out here? <laughs> um, you know, you can provide places to give people different kinds of uh, experiences so they come in more contact with the water. So this has a big pier that walks, people can walk out and fish. And, uh, to give you some idea what it kind of looks like. So it's a normal park. This community came up to me afterwards and just thanked us for doing this project. Because they were, it's a blue collar community. They make airplanes. They do a steel. They didn't have anything and they really love it. They go down and they walk and enjoy it and go by the water. There's towers. The interesting thing what we did, we wanted people to come in contact with nature, not just sit and look at it. So out on that pier that goes way out, one side's got a railing, and then one side's got a little kind of place where you can set with your grandkids. You can fish. You get close to the water. You can see people really enjoy that. It's not just a kind of a... Then we created some places. We had to restore the whole shoreline. It was an industrial dump site. I mean, it was really bad. And the salmon couldn't even spawn there. We were screwing the salmon up ourselves. But when we were all done, people could come out and we put these rocks out. And so you could go out and sit with your kids by the water and enjoy that. And this is what it was before we got started. That's just a, that's a one shot of the shoreline here. It was a total mess. So it's really nice to be involved in parks. And again, I like the architecture stuff. It's kind of fun to do. This, this won the National AIA Honor Award. It beat out skyscrapers. It's a lifeguard station. <laughs> that makes me feel good. The way else it was in the architecture. It was, a, it was a neat project. And um, so we, did, we do parks all over the place. Um, some that we're doing nowadays, it sort of got us between the zoo work and the park work, got us into these kind of areas. This is near Seattle. Microsoft is right up there. And this is the city of Bellevue. This was a big area that had this wonderful wetlands and uh, stream through it, and the parks department over in that area and saved it. And they, they wanted to have an interpretive center to talk about the environment, because this is the closest place to the urban area where people can, kids, families can go and learn about wildness. You know? uh, so we did boardwalks and got that done, and we we designed a, a visitor center, interpretive center for that area. The neighbors up above, on the slopes up above, do not want to have a building. Um, the client came to us and said, we want one building out there. And uh, 
people that live on the slope said, well, you don't want to look at a building. You want to continue to look at the natural thing out there. So what we did is we broke it into parts and organized it around courtyards for two reasons. One, to help in letting trees grow up and soften down. And then I-90 goes right by this site. There's I-90, all the way to Philadelphia. You can imagine the traffic right there, and it's very noisy in uh, you know, half the day with the traffic. And I was walking out here, and I went behind a little building. And have you ever gone down wind on a sailboat, and how all of a sudden it goes quiet? You know, it's that, as soon as I went behind that building, which was about five foot square, it just went absolutely quiet. So let's see, let's go back to it. So what we did is we organized around and let the buildings close that off a little bit and allowed then people to come outside their classrooms and view out into the wetlands and use them. So, and then, uh, then we said, let's make it sod roof. There's a great history of sod roofs here all over Minnesota, you know, native and non-native, same in the Northwest, up in Alaska. So, and there's some of them been in place for 60 years or longer. So. We, we decided we're going to do that, and that's this thing that's going to really get under construction. And uh, it's, a, it's fun to deal with that. One other one that just to give you an idea of dealing with big natural systems. There's a river, and the Nisqually people live along this river. There's a river that starts at Mount Rainier and goes all the way down the Puget Sound. It's a wonderful river. And there's an organization made up of the Army, two or three towns, and the Squally people, and the State Department of Ecology, and they manage that river. They look after it. It's really a neat thing. And they wanted to have an interpretive center to let people know about this long river and all that it has contributed in history to both pioneering people, Indian people, and the natural world. And I just wanted to show you, we do some pretty straight architecture a lot of times, but What's nice about this is this jets out into the trees so people can learn about, um, and they're just starting to understand this. You know, you would go to Africa or South America and you'd go on the canopy walks. Well, the foresters in the Northwest said, well, there's nothing up there in the Northwest in those trees. Well, I found recently that there are a lot of things happening at that upper level. So instead of doing elevators and going up and down and that, we, we went up located this on the side of a slope so you can, the tree starts here and by the time it gets up here you can just walk straight out and you know, learn about that. So it's a it's a place to learn about the entire environment. Does that look familiar? <laughs> we we from those parks and natural systems, the national park we've been uh, around the whole United States in various places we've been working from Yosemite to um, Glacier Bay in Alaska. And um, when I was a young kid, I got the hike up to the uh, spend the night. It was a pretty, pretty neat place. It has a memory for me uh, as a high school, high school kid. But what's happening to the valley, Yosemite, is that we're loving it to death. And we're stopping the natural systems from working there. So we work with the National Park. But what should be pulled out? How can you? make it a good experience for people and keep the natural systems intact so you can see the bears and the birds and the water and all that and then sort of people get rid of some of this stuff and so they just released that report but it's trying to get rid of this <laughs> you know trying to keep that from happening and so our, that's led to a lot of different areas around the world that we've been working this is in Ghana, West Africa they teamed up with Conservation International and uh, the um, United Nations to do their first national park. Now, they don't know, they didn't know, what do you do in a national park? <laughs> I mean, what do you, what, what's a visitor center? Uh, you know, what's an interpretive center? What's a viewing tower? What's a, how do you get, you know, involved? So, a few of us went over there, took vacation, they paid for our expense, we went over and worked with the, they have the same kind of problems we're having here and that they're destroying the forest and so the rivers are getting pretty much polluted and then the shore line, the fish population is going down. So it's a complex thing. It was the first place that slaves were brought to you know, the western hemisphere. 
So the Smithsonian was there working on restoring these castles to tell the slave story so we don't forget it. What we were there was to talk about the forest and what it offers. Um, this, from the shoreline back, it, uh, it used to be the forest was within a mile of the shoreline. Now it's back I don't know, 10 miles or something like that. It's going, it's going fast. So they, they got some of it protected. And that's what we were working with. And this is giving an idea of some of the trees that are in there. Uh, that's, uh, that's 30 feet across right there. You, you, see, you can't imagine how big these, these trees are in this location. And, and you know what's protecting that tree? Ants. <laughs> I, it's hard to believe it, but all around that, for about 50 feet around that tree, are these very aggressive ants. You come in that territory, they attack you. <laughs> They've got a symbiosis thing going with that tree. They protect that tree. It's pretty interesting. Well, anyway, long story, we worked with the, the African Ghanaian people, and ultimately they built a visitor center. And at first they were trying to do tourism, but they found that they have more people coming from their own country to here because they didn't have any place to go and learn about the environment. And so they found that they have a lot of people from their own country coming to this location. So and what's interesting to me was, was this. This was the Paramount Chief. And when we, when we were there, we got a, a, um, a, a uh, you come in and meet him, and we were told ahead of time, well, you don't talk directly to him, you talk to his right-hand person. And you don't cross your leg in front of him, and you do this and this. So we were all nervous, and we went in, and we talked, we talked to this other man, and I talked to him in his language and all that. And then, then they said, well, if you'd like to take some pictures of the chief, you can go outside. And so this is, we were taking some pictures. And then finally the chief said, in clear English, where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And we're talking to him, and he, he graduated from Michigan State. <laughs> there he was in this village. It's a wonderful thing. There's, a, there's a, a chief in every village. Only the women vote. No men vote. Only the women vote. If that chief isn't taking care of the community, he's out of there. But they, they, they know that, and so they stay pretty close to taking care of it. It's a pretty interesting system. Um, anyway, it was fun to work with them and to help, because they're, like here in this country, the women, the Native women held the knowledge of the farm that <coughs> was out there. It was out there in the land, and they held that knowledge. The same here in, in Africa. That forest is the pharmacy, so if you destroy it, then that's it. You know, so, Interesting experience. So we're, we're getting involved in those kinds of things around the world. We're doing some in Central America and, and South America right now. And a little bit in native country around this. There's a big effort that we need to work in in native country to protect our lands, our homelands. So one more thing about gardens and parks. Singapore Botanical Garden was uh, and is the first place that orchids were domesticated. And it hadn't had a master plan for 150 years. So being architects and landscape architects, we got to go there and be involved with them and their plan for their facilities. And these are old colonial buildings on the site in Singapore. And we worked at restoring those. And I don't have any pictures to really show you of all that right now. But it, uh, we worked with the government of Singapore. All that's been restored. They're used as interpretive centers or labs or offices. And the gardens are fantastic, big orchid gardens. There. Now, this, this is the master plan for the whole thing. And the orchid gardens are up at here. There's a big visitor center. That little building I just showed you is this one right here in this location. So there's a big spice islands thing so they can generate money because it's a famous place where a lot of our spices came from. Um, Indian country. Um, Powwows, <laughs> circles, these are circle people. This is over in eastern Washington, which is different than on the coast where I live, but there's square people. <laughs> square people. Uh, these people asked me to come, you know, a number of years ago and work with them to help them bring back a, uh, a, uh, some of their cultural objects that were found in the film. And, and just to, I want to show you a few of these before I get into the National Museum. Um, it's kind of interesting dealing with 
uh, what I call a stand in our culture. It's too easy for us to hire somebody that, that, that really doesn't uh, allow us to stand in our culture. I mean, we get to do it as, as when we get on our regalia and do that things, but I think there's more than that. Let's, I always say to the young architects, many of our kids, let's take it and put it out there in front of everybody and stand in it so they'll see it. And, uh, this is the long house at Evergreen State College in the south of uh, Seattle. I uh, worked with uh, three native artists, it's a big thunderbird over the entrance. Two artists worked on that. Very strong symbolic thing. There's a couple of carved figures, a man and a woman greeting you as you come in. That's interesting. On the inside, uh, there's uh, some windows in a, in a space they call the traditional longhouse space where they teach the longhouse way. <coughs> it's kind of interesting, you know, to learn what that is. And it's not something that's dividable. Um, it's, uh, it's a holistic thing. And, uh, but we needed some windows because, you know, it's a state college and had to have some windows. So when they're teaching, they pull these screens across. And there's some big uh, screens on the side here that are hand woven and painted. And there was an artist and his family and students, non Indian and Indian, who wove that. They're, they're pretty good size. So it was a wonderful structure that tried to relate to the, the uh, coastal culture of Puget uh, Sound. A lot of Native people have been chased or driven around this country. And uh, this is one that's close to my cart. This was a Chief Joseph. He's uh, something I like hold up. He's a peace shield, but strong. And we work with the National Park Service and the Nez Perce people and a number of states to develop a, a linear interpretive thing about that situation where they were actually going to go to the reservation and they were attacked and had to basically defend themselves and then they headed for the Canadian border and then they were tracked up at that border up there. It's a wonderful story that spans three or four states and uh, that's the kind of work we get involved in, telling those stories the way they should be told. And, um, and then we do a lot of museums, small museums that are like this one, it may be hard for you to see, but this is desert people. It's the Agua Caliente people in Palm Springs. Again, the women um, basically set up uh, something back in the uh, 40s and 50s to uh, um, get a hotel that started generating money for them. And then they found that they could lease some of their lands out. Not all of it, the sacred part they kept some of the lands that were already encircled by development, they leased out. So they generate some pretty good money now, and they also have a casino now, too. And they, the first thing they want to do is have a, what they call a museum, uh, that will talk about their culture, to tell a lot of people about them and their relationship with the desert all around them. And it's kind of fun working, you know, from a forest to the desert to the water, all that. And they're, they're around people, so this will really be the perspective of them. Um, that, that was kind of like a picture show. What, what I want to talk to you about is something else. Um, so put up with this just for a minute. We are connected to something larger than just ourselves. It's what we share. And it's very strong in the Native community. It's not a vision or a philosophy. It's not a path of enlightenment. It's something much more understandable, sent by my ancestors to guide us and help us know that we're connected to something larger than just ourselves. There is a wonderful example of this at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, D.C. by a Indian artist named Bill Reed. He just recently passed away. He was a wonderful man. This large black canoe is filled with plants. It's filled with uh, spirits. It's filled with animals. And it's totally full. There's hardly any room in the canoe. 
The oneness of this canoe's message is that we are all connected and we're in it together. And this sculpture centers around my four, the four worlds of my Native American heritage. Now, I'm not saying that every Native person does things this way, but we have some connections amongst all of us. And it's a very complex interrelationship, but it's very simple. It deals with the animal world, the human world, the spirit world, and the natural world. Again, that's me when I was younger working for the Makara Indians, where I got the first taste of working with Native people in, in their own community. So I want to tell you a little bit about the natural world. Uh, the, it's full of a lot of things that you wouldn't think of that is in the natural world. Um, most people think, well, native people, you know, they're, they're connected to the environment, you know, they're plants and all that stuff. But there's a lot more to the natural world than just plants. Plants are just one dimension of that, I think. And so these are some things that I think are important when you're designing and planning something for native people to keep in mind. Because a lot of the elders, a lot of people have messages and stories that go with these things. And it's very important to talk about them. And that's like, whatever you do needs to connect to various things, such as sometimes the cardinal directions, uh, seasons. Uh, it needs to connect to plants that have power, night and day. Water. There's a lot of things that make up the natural world. This pot is pretty interesting. This is an old Hopi pot. I can find something like this just about everywhere across the country. That, that's full of thunder and water and mountains and direction, four directions. And it's really an interesting thing that was that this potter, this ancient potter, put in. And most stories and things are still common today. And what's really interesting is this. See that circle doesn't totally complete itself? That, that's a person that really understands life. You know, it's very important. We're not, you know, we don't do things perfect. I love the animal world. Um, I, to me, that's a very important one. In the Northwest, it's so strong, it comes forward more than anywhere else that I run into. But it's very important to when I'm working on projects to talk about that with the people that I'm working with and go over that because the animal world represents a lot of things. And I'll show you how that's put to work here. In a bit. And the spirit world. Um, you know, that deals with some very important things of healing and cleansing, uh, birth and death and creation and renewal, visioning, continuum of time. It's things that deal in that realm that need to be, some of it, understood. Some things should not be put out in the public when you're dealing with Native people and designing projects. But there's a lot that needs to be talked about and worked on. And, you know, this is out of a book. You might have seen it. It deals with the Hopi people. Every year they go to a certain place and they renew the earth. They keep it going for us. They do. If they didn't do that, it might be pretty tough for all of us. And the native people do that all over the place. And then there's the human world. Language and storytelling, creativity, male and female, welcoming and hospitality. So when you're designing something, it isn't a lobby, it's the welcoming place. Little subtle things like that. Are very important. Passing on knowledge. I just want to read a, a couple of short things, real short, that just kind of give you a little story about the natural world. And this is uh, dealing with the starting up of the, before we even did anything at the Longhouse Project at Evergreen State College. And this is from me. It says, I often talk to animals, you know, but I seldom talk to building sites. 
Recently, I was asked to speak to the place that had been selected by a client to be the location of the new Longhouse Cultural Center. Four Macaw Indians and elders at the same ceremony sang and spoke to the site along with all the Native people that came to that event. We all spoke a similar message to the site. This is what we said. We have just not come to build on this site, but first to speak to it, explaining our intentions. We promised to use the site wisely and not deviate, but to give it a new purpose. We ask the site not to be angry with us if we dig and remove a few trees and that sort of thing. We thanked it for its sacrifice. We asked the site to accept this longhouse. It was funny, we never heard the site talk back to us, <laughs> but we knew it hurt us. We were very careful what we did there, that we treated the site as a living thing. And I'll tell you another little one. So that, that's a practical way to put that into good use. Um, another one that deals with the longhouse. Uh, we had just finished, you know, if you know how architecture goes, you have different phases of doing things. And we were ready to go into construction drawings, and you don't want to make a lot of changes at that point. You want to get the drawings done so somebody can build it because you're finished with the designing of it. Well, Pauline Hilaire, who was one of the elders of the Lummi tribe, of the three sisters that had worked very hard on this longhouse over 20 years to get it happen, she called me up, and I was just about ready to go home, and she said, i got to talk to you. <laughs> And it was hard for Pauline to explain 